we try and mirror the needs of Kern County. So we, we always sort of keep an eye out, okay, what's going on in the next 5, 10, 15 years? And what sort of services can we provide that add value to our region and really bring sort of that sort of say, maybe cliche, but economic prosperity to the region, right? We're, mm-hmm. we're pretty proud of Kern County. We're proud of California. And we want to we want to bring uh, more development, more jobs, more um, prosperity here. And so we, we serve things from civil uh, engineering and land development to permitting services. That was Eric Danens from Cornerstone Engineering talking about the new philosophy of an engineering firm. Eric is formally educated in engineering and business with experience in operations and strategy. Eric brings an organized and well-rounded perspective to the energy industry. He regularly performs long-term strategic decarbonization plans at the intersections of economic, technology, and policy, making sense of the complex energy landscape. He holds a chemical engineering degree from the University of Minnesota, as well as a master's in global energy management from the University of Colorado. Alex has 12 years of oil and gas manager professional experience with a diverse and balanced skill set of process improvement, engineering, regulatory, project management, IT analysis, employee development, asset retirement, obligations, and document control to steward collaboration and execution of these components across complex business environments. Understanding of the importance and value prioritization and how that is managed with multiple deadlines. Focused approach on value and process excellence. Engineering experience in all facets of oil and gas industry, including drilling, production, completion, geology, facilities, and reservoir engineering. Regulatory expertise and compliance manager, data-driven decision maker that has entrepreneur minded with technical communication skills. In today's show, we discussed carbon capture. And later in the show, we talked about well abandonment or asset retirement. Welcome back to the Our Two Cents podcast, the show where your local professionals sit down with an array of guests to hear their story and impart some wisdom for both business and life improving skills. This is your place to hear business and community leaders discuss relevant topics that matter to you. And welcome to the show today. My name is Troy Burden. I will be your host today of Our Two Cents. Thanks for joining us. Before we get into today's episode, I encourage our listeners to go check us out on all of the social media platforms. We're out there on Instagram and Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube and Twitter. Eric and Alex, we're happy to have you to join us today. Thanks for being here. I can't wait to get into today's topics. Uh, I know both of you guys from uh, Cornerstone. Uh, We have a partnership together and uh, I've seen Cornerstone grow and want to get into some of the things that you guys specialize in and talk a little bit about your passions. But uh, so tell us a little bit. I'll start with you, Eric. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your company and what you guys do. Yeah, awesome, Troy. Thanks for uh, having us here. Glad to be on the show. Glad to be able to talk about uh, Cornerstone and, and what we do. So as you know, we're, gosh, something like 60 or 70 people now. We're a really diverse company. We talk about this all the time. We try and mirror the needs of Kern County. So we, we always sort of keep an eye out, okay, what's going on in the next 5, 10, 15 years? And what sort of services can we provide that add value to our region and really bring sort of that sort of say maybe cliche, but economic prosperity to the region, right? We're, Mm -hmm. we're pretty proud of Kern County. We're proud of California and we want to, we want to bring more development, more jobs, more um, prosperity here. And so we, we serve things from civil uh, engineering and land development to permitting services. And Alex will get into a lot of that to strategic planning on energy projects and project engineering and all sorts of things in between. Tell me a little bit about Cornerstone. How long has Cornerstone been around? Kind of the business philosophy. I know it's changed. There's been some acquisition and partnerships. It's kind of a new breed, if you will, moving forward. When did this kind of start and happen? Yeah, it's funny. Troy, we get this a lot these days that um, people sort of say, yeah, you're, you're sort of a different type of engineering company than we uh-huh. normally work with. So we get that a lot. Um, so look, Cornerstone's been around for, gosh, over 40 years now. And um, it was really bred from civil engineering and some survey as well. Okay. And we had a lot of stable uh, activity through, gosh, 35 of those years. Well, sometime in tw- 2017 or 2018, um, Kent Halley uh, 
bought in, became a partner, and and he sort of used his connections and vision to start growing Cornerstone into what it is today, right? And sort of diversifying um, and growing some of the energy parts of the business. And then now, I like to think of us as a pretty entrepreneurial engineering company. We're not just sort of transactional professional engineers. We like to think outside the box. Um, one of those with uh, Alex here as, as well, which I'm happy to have him talk about here a little bit further. But um, yeah, we like to think that we're pretty flexible and dynamic. No, I, I think you are. I mean, I do business with a lot of engineering firms and they all kind of seem to have a very strategic focus, which is fine if uh, <laughs> If that's a uh, lucrative, uh, consistent industry, uh, as we know in the oil industry, it can be very volatile. Uh, there's more work than we can handle, and then there's no work. So, uh, you know, I come from the oil industry, and it's kind of why I actually left the oil industry is because it was too volatile. Um, so, uh, but so you guys are very diversified with when it comes to clean energy, just about anything. Um, you know, I looked at your webpage. I even seen some of your architectural work. Uh, my best friend's uh, building, you guys designed, you know, and then, you know, shopping center over here at Frolic. Uh, you know, yep. and I had no idea that. I did know that you did some civil work. But I, I learned a lot. So it's not just building plants and doing certain types of engineering waterworks or whatever that might be refining. Uh, it's very diversified, which uh, probably is pretty smart today because uh, you, you got to follow wherever the industry leads you. And yeah. so that makes sense. So we have uh, Alex Virgil, uh, a guest as well. He is a uh, partner also in Cornerstone. And Alex, you're fairly new to Cornerstone. Tell us a little bit about your story, your journey, and uh, how you ended up there and, and what your uh, goal is with Well Done. Yeah. No, thanks, Troy. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's been interesting journey for sure. It started out with me wanting to start my own company and, you know, kind of take a, take a leap of faith and a risk. And um, it, it formed into a partnership between Well Done Consulting and Cornerstone. And through that partnership, I kind of saw what we had previously discussed, all the synergies between asset retirement, plug and abandonment, regulatory services, and the specialty engineering firm that Cornerstone is, right? And so there was a lot of growth opportunities and synergies between what I was trying to establish and what Cornerstone already provided. I think, you know, just to kind of piggyback off of the previous conversation of Cornerstone, one thing that I saw that was extremely unique to Cornerstone as a business is they carry such a strong uh, presence on front end processes, whether that's regulatory or design. And it really takes a strategic firm in California that understands those to be able to execute efficiently, right? And so you have a lot of very strategic consulting firms that aren't thinking, how do I navigate the regulatory complexity, which is one of the main things that Cornerstone does so well and is a big portion of what Well Done uh, really focuses on, on the idle management. So, so help me out. So front-end processes, is that what you're talking about? Making sure that this actually could actually happen through permitting yeah. and approval before we even spend the time and the money and the effort to go, great idea, great design, but we'll never get it approved. Exactly. And like uh, an example would be you want to do some strategic consulting on an acquisition, right? Well, you could hire a McKinsey or a big consulting firm, but they're not going to understand the regular timing, the permitting issues, CEQA, Ida Walmart, right. all the implications that are unique to California. And so that's where it's it's a very unique scenario. So it makes a lot of sense to work with someone local that understands our beautiful California climate, which is uh, the most difficult probably in the nation. So yeah. I, I can see where you're coming from there. So no matter how big and mighty you are, you can be the biggest engineering firm in the world. But if you don't have a California presence and a foot in the game, it's kind of hard to navigate and understand the process to get stuff to the finish line. Yeah. And that's kind of what, uh, and well done, what we focus specifically is navigating those regulatory complexities and then rolling it into the engineering aspect of of idle management and asset retirement. So there was so many synergies in the sense of, all right, even from a civil land development, surveying, regulatory, all those established divisions that Cornerstone already had uh, was a really nice, well done idle management is a really nice bolt on service to what was already being right. so well executed, right? Right. So um, asset retirement is a fancy word and I'm just going to dumb it down a little bit. It's basically well abandonment. Um, and surface remediation. Sure, understand. And, you know, I'm going to tell you a little story because uh, I'm a Taft boy. 
and I cut my teeth on oil patch and worked there 15 years or so selling equipment. And before all the regulatory uh, requirements, um, they used to do things kind of like the Wild West. And I'm sure you have pictures and you've seen it, but... I remember when I was a kid, we had friends that lived in Bell Ridge, and we used to go out there and ride motorcycles on the weekends, way out there. And I found abandoned wells that basically they pull the, the top of the wellhead off, and they take a telephone pole, and they drive it into the, the casing. And uh, that was a well abandonment back then, and I know it's, it's changed drastically. And, you know, my father was in the oil industry for 28 years, and uh, I learned a lot. And one thing he said, and I knew from doing business in the oil industry— and I hope that I never see this day uh, that California is no longer a oil producing uh, state. But he says, if the oil industry was over, there would be 50 years of cleanup. And that's probably <laughs> fairly accurate. So how many wells do you think are in the state that are idle that need to be abandoned, Alex? So yeah, no, that's a great question. Because even though a well is idle, Uh, It still may hold potential. You know, California is a unique uh, geologic setting where you have multiple reservoirs, multiple stack pay. You have a lot of technologies on increasing recovery. And so while the well is idle, I don't necessarily want to deem those needing to be plugged. But if you were to look across the state, there's somewhere between 30 to 40,000 wells that fall in the idle category. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. So uh, living around Taft, there was a lot of wells around Taft that have been idle for years. And I just figured they were on the hit list at some point they're going to be abandoned. Uh, and it's all about economics. And uh, the price, uh, you know, based on the gravity of the oil and the lifting cost, uh, it just didn't make sense to go in and put a rig on them and actually pump them. There was no profit in it. And then when the oil industry, oil cost of oil got up a little higher, 70 80 $90 a barrel, uh, it kind of made sense. And now most of those wells around Taft are pumping again. So mm-hmm. uh, I completely understand where you're coming from there. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because, um, you know, one of the things we get approached a lot on new technologies yep. and and. Eric will talk about it a little bit, but you know, you got all these straws in the ground that are touching core pieces of the earth from a storage or, you know, just in different recovery. We've seen some really innovative technologies on what you do with idle wells. And so those wells themselves can be assets, right? So it's really finding, figuring out which wells do need to be plugged from a surface room, from a safety standpoint, from both freshwater and surface side of things, but also which ones still hold potential and future potential, right? Because we don't know what technologies will evolve. Right. And we've seen uh, conversion wells too. A producing well might be an injection well at some point in their lifetime. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the permitting process of uh, to do an abandonment in uh, California. Yeah. The permitting process follows a very similar process of a, a work over a new drill, but you're probably more likely to get a permit from the state when you're trying to plug it than... The- that was kind of my <laughs> next question. Yeah, I bet the, the tape isn't as red as it is on it's, the other things. No, it's not as red. Um, you know, I... Unfortunately, I saw a LinkedIn post from the Railroad Commission yesterday, and uh, they were touting that they had issued 700 drill permits in the state of Texas in the month of October. And I thought to myself, hmm, okay. Well, must be nice. It must be nice. That's probably about as many plug and abandonment permits that Calgem issued in the last couple months. I don't know that we've had 700 in California in the last 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's quite a deal um so it's fairly easy uh and of course there's a process sorry not no uh, this i don't want to say it's easy there's still there's still it's california that's right california you still have to follow CEQA and the noi process and um there's there's a series of events that take place but it's easier i guess can you just talk generally and i mean every situation is going to be different based on the well the depth the zones i get it but can you give me an idea of a cost of abandoning a, a 800 foot producing well? Sure. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And costs can vary dramatically depending on which district you're in. So Calgem has a couple different districts. They have three specifically. They have an inland district, which covers mainly the Central Valley. They have a southern district, which covers LA Basin and the north. And then they have a northern district that runs all the way from Sacramento to the Ventura, Santa Barbara area. So even the cost based on districts change quite a bit because you can imagine like if you're mobbing equipment to Ventura, then you're paying per diem and all the costs associated with those people. But just for round numbers, I'd say, you know, a thousand foot well in Kern County can range anywhere from 15 to 45,000, right? But you have costs that can go anywhere from a $15,000 cost for a shallow well 
all the way up to a million dollars for a, a coastal well, right? So sure. it really depends on the depth and complexity that, you, that you're dealing with. And unfortunately, there's no return on that investment. It's it's part of the end of the cycle of you've already made your money, hopefully, on that well, and now you're putting it to bed. Yep. And it, you know, then and that's I think one of the one of the things that we try to help is really manage that strategy on cash flows and integrating what the operators' financials are into how do they manage their liabilities. Right. It was kind of interesting. It was kind of a thought that I had because coming from an insurance world, there's these things called reserves. Insurance has to have reserves. Banks have to have reserves. And I under kind of wondered if an oil company was to go solvent that you know do they have to put away money or earmark money and say this is for you know at the end of the in, end of the road we have this money to go ahead and clean up what we done. Yeah, there is bonding requirements. Yep. Um, but typically the bonding amounts for the liabilities are not high enough, yep. right? So re- what Calgem did in 2019, Calgem is the regulatory body that governs oil and gas in the state of California. Right. What they did in 2019 is they basically said, hey, you have all these idle wells. We need you to start testing for mechanical integrity that these wells are good or RTPing them or you need to plug them, right? So they took all that potential liability at the end of life, which it makes sense in the sense that at the end of life, you have no more production, you know, more producing reserves. So what are you going to manage those liabilities with? And they thought, okay, we need to start having operators manage these more responsibly. But by doing that, they've really put a lot of pressure on the oil and gas operators. Sure. So I, I got to assume, I understand that you pull all the tubing out, you probably go in and put packers in it and backfill it with concrete or cement them off at certain you know requirements uh, based upon the specification. Uh, I imagine you cut it off uh, 15, 20 feet below the surface, and then you probably do dirt remediation, and then you're, you're hopefully, once you're done, that this should look like there was never a well there. That's correct, yep. Is that somewhat accurate? Yeah, it's pretty close. Pretty good guess? Interesting. Documentation and reporting. So do you have to monitor these? I mean, once they're abandoned, if you will, or put to bed, uh, what is there, I mean, is there a way to, is there inst- is there technology where you, they can monitor those wells and... So typically once the well's plugged, then there are certain uh, divisions where they'll require you to leak test to show you that it's not leaking, but you have a 60-day period where you submit a well history. Okay. And during that well history and during the operations too, you have a permit that gets issued um, according to the plugging abandonment operations, and they're watching that you're aligning your operations with the permitting. So if it says, hey, I'm going to pump cement across this zone, Calgem's going to be out there witnessing the tag of that cement. So they're checking along the way so that at the conclusion of the well, they know when you submit the history, they're going to read through it and basically say, yep, this well is plugged according to the standard or no, you didn't meet the specifications of this permit. Right. And are you, Cornerstone, are you doing any of the labor or are you doing all of the administration and engineering and specifications and approval process? But are you actually doing the, the, obviously you're not in the rig business, but uh, there's a lot of different components from the people that seem in it to the rigs to uh, maybe even someone coming in and, uh, you know, dirt removing and stuff like that. Are you contracting that or are you leaving that up to somebody else? No, we like to stay independent of the contractors because it it allows us to provide the best solution for the client client, right? right. Sure. So if we have a package of say 20 wells, right, we can now work with on behalf of the operator to go and work with the contractors to figure out which is the best pricing or who should we use. So we don't necessarily tie ourselves to a specific contractor for that purpose, right? Right. So from um, my well, understanding, um, the budget in the oil industry in California has been zero for, you know, maybe operating budget, but no new capital, much, much capital. And of course, permitting is not really there. Um, do you see a lot of activity currently in well abandonment? Is this a, a going process? Um, um, yeah, it's it's pretty substantial. And it was actually one of the main, well, not the reason, but it was a big reason of why I left my former company because um, at my former company, I had a team that was responsible with basically strategically scheduling and putting together budgets for board of directors and plans and schedules. So we started modeling, all right, how much activity is going to take place over an eight-year period? And then I looked across the state and said, oh, my gosh, this is going to be so much work. So I would say there's somewhere between two and 3,000 wells a year that are getting plugged in the state of California. Wow. So it's it's quite a bit of activity. That's probably the most activity is going on. There. Yeah. When, at my former company, the in 2022, 
we tripled our our number of P and A's per year, and it was over eight hundred just from one company. Wow. Well, so like I said, I, I knew there was a lot of it, and I, I just didn't know how active it actually was currently. So that's kind of good to hear. Um, uh, they need to take care of that, and uh, obviously do it professionally and properly, and it sounds like you got a great resource and a great team behind you at Cornerstone. So, yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, glad to see you uh, as an addition uh, to them. So, Eric, let's talk uh, something that I've been hearing about for two or three years. I don't know if it's been that long, but carbon capture. Not real familiar with it. Done a little research. I don't know. I, I don't want to say I have mixed feelings about it, but you're the genius or the engineer behind it. You're going to give me uh, a little bit of uh, education and our listeners. But like I said, I've been hearing about it and it didn't really make sense, uh, but I'm going to hand it to you and, and, and educate us. So carbon capture, is is that the proper term or is there a, a tricky word besides that? Uh- I'm actually going to make you wait a little bit. Okay. So, real quick, I you're was going to you're going to make you're going to pass the test over to me. I see. I, I'm right. going to make you wait. Okay. Uh, All right. So, look, I was listening to um, what you and Alex were talking about, and yeah. I really quickly wanted to sort of draw some uh, synergies and some some reasons we're working together. Um, so, Cornerstone has a permitting and regulatory department uh, that regularly works with CEQA and oil and gas permits and underground injection uh, projects. And so you can imagine there's an obvious sort of synergy between um, our two companies right now that has just been fantastic. And the second thing you kind of... Well, that's um, kind of cool. That means that means uh, Alex doesn't have to do, do, do everything. He's got specialists in certain departments that handle those things. That just makes you that much stronger. Yep, that's right. And one of the other things I really wanted to, um, you know, we went through it pretty quick, which is this, the site remediation. Yeah. So we have a land development group, right? We do yes. land development. We do civil engineering. We're the front end, like Alex mentioned. Okay, so you've got some wells okay so you, you you know you put them you know 15 15 feet below grade you you know move them off you make sure they're properly abandoned and guess what now you've got a piece of land that you can develop and so a lot of times those two things go hand in hand there's oil wells that might be on existing uh pieces of land that somebody wants to develop like california avenue like california Avenue. <laughs> and just to add to that because the wells are already abandoned doesn't preclude it from the evaluation process for land development so it goes through what they call a construction well site review where Calgium's going to look at the well and see if it's properly remediated because, you know, maybe in the 1920s, a telephone pole was shoved down there. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. No, no so, that makes a lot of sense to, to have those strengths behind you. That's, uh, that's great synergy. Yeah. So. Uh, carbon capture. Yeah, let's talk carbon capture. So first, I want to bring it bring it to a high level real quick. So why, right? Why are we talking about carbon capture? So um, especially here in California, the uh, the nature is or the idea is that the um, increased emissions due to the, sort of the industrial revolution that humans have sort of gone, overgone or uh, gone through the last 150 years has created some sort of warming on the globe that is causing some you know ripple effects and some issues. And so there's a lot of attention now on uh, managing the emissions, right? That's what all this is about is managing the emissions, the carbon dioxide specifically. Right. That is a uh, greenhouse gas pollutant that adds to the global, uh, sorry, the greenhouse uh, warming effect. And so all of this is about managing emissions. So um, our state has done a lot of work on uh, how to uh, manage those emissions, right? And so they've put together some aggressive, I'll say very aggressive plans about becoming what people call net neutral or net zero. And what they mean is for, um, you know, you might be uh, negatively, you know, sequestering some emissions, you might be uh, emitting some emissions, but overall, there's sort of a net zero of the human's sort of uh, interactions or impact in the environment. And so we've set some really aggressive goals, right, to get to that point. And um, the state has acknowledged very much that carbon capture which is, as it sounds, capturing carbon generally from an emission source, like a power plant, for example, or a gas plant, uh, capturing those carbon emissions. Um, And then, so so the other sort of acronym you can think of is so carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration. So CCUS. And so the utilization... Don't ask me to repeat that. Right? Utilization and sequestration, right, is uh, doing something with it. Okay, you've got the carbon. Now what are you going to do with it? So yeah, utilization, as you can imagine, right? Using it for something else. Um, the most common things that people think about uh, existing industries like food, food and beverage for uh, or dry ice. Right. Now those volumes are very small. And so people are looking at new ways of using CO2. Yes. Um, there's even projects where they're taking hydrogen yes. uh, and CO2, combining them to make synthetic, well, I'm going to call it synthetic natural gas. 
So they'll use, they actually use the CO2, use the hydrogen uh, to form natural gas, right? And then you can use that natural gas as a uh, regular process heat. But that natural gas came from sort of a, a renewable source, if you will. So is one of the biggest products in carbon capture, if you will, lack of the term, um, CO2? Is that the primary element? Yes. So at the end of the carbon Which capture- Which is a very interesting element. Uh, going back into my oil industry, I sold equipment that- were in some very hazardous conditions, uh, harsh conditions, and CO2 was one of the hardest ones, especially with O-ring seals, because we had a a thing called explosive decombustion. Mm -hmm. And we learned this in Columbia on a drilling rig when they had a CO2 issue, which there was no CO2 in the specifications, so the valve was not built for CO2. There was CO2 in the line, and the O-rings in the valves absorbed the CO2, and then as the pressure released downstream, it releases so fast from the O-ring, it explodes the O-ring. And so I'm a little familiar with the CO2 industry, but it's never been good. So Sounds like Troy needs a consulting job. I was yeah, going to say, that was pretty technical. I'm impressed. <laughs> so I'm impressed. I know it's a harsh element. So when you're building carbon capture equipment, are these specifications pretty severe? Uh, I mean, are they just carbon? Are we using stainless? Are we using synthetics? Uh, can you can you expand yeah. on that just a little bit? So a lot we don't want to go too deep down there, but I just want to talk about this is not this is not as easy as it may sound. It's both, you know, it's funny. We talk about this a lot. It's both not as easy as it sounds and we have to treat it with incredible respect, but it's, and it's also something that's been done for many decades. Okay. Right. CO2 handling has been done. It's been done in plants. They've done uh, sequestration and uh, enhanced oil recovery for uh, four or five decades so far. So people have been handling this stuff for a long time. And Um, hold on one more, one more side note. CO2 is a product that we use in the food industry and sodas, right? Yeah. Okay. Same stuff. Same stuff. It's um, interesting. You know, one of the things too, to add to that and Eric just covered on, but it's been a part of oil and gas operations. CO2 floods is commonly used across all of Texas, right? So I don't want to dismiss the uh, reality that CO2 uh, can be a dangerous gas, but it's also something that's been handled for a long time. And so believe it or not, uh, in a regular, I'll say regular, and maybe a typical application of carbon capture, uh, some, you know, typical uh, carbon steel, a lot of times is sufficient. Now, depending on where it's at or what sort of uh, other chemicals, it's not the CO2 that generally causes the problem. It's maybe some of the other contaminants. Okay. And so a simple one uh, is actually uh, water. So CO2 and water uh, uh, will form uh, carbonic acid and carbonic acid is very uh, corrosive. So if you've got a typical carbon steel pipeline yes. and you've got a little bit of water, you know, it's not, not that much. You can, you can start forming carbonic acid um, and it'll severely diminish the life of that uh, so pipeline, very, for example. Very corrosive. Yeah. Yep. So the, so what happens is, you know, in, in some parts of the, uh, of the country, they'll even use carbon steel for wet, it's called, you know, wet yep. CO2 service and they internally coat it. Right. Okay. So there's a lot yeah. of internal coatings yeah. that people are familiar with. Um, and then in some cases, they'll just go, they'll go to stainless, of course. But um, and most they, of these, are these high pressure systems or necessarily no? You know, it's funny. High pressure is relative. Um, yeah, what's so high we're, pressure? we're talking about something on the order of 1500 to 2000 uh, PSI. That's high. Yeah. I'd consider it high personally, but um, there's industries, the hydrogen industry. Uh, there's, so my work point is 10, you can't use fiberglass. You can't use plastic. Yeah. Of course, yeah. definitely, definitely. Yeah, These Eric, are- can you talk about the state of CO two that it needs to be in for sequestration? Yeah, so so CO two is typically a gas, um, and and gases can be sort of inefficient to transfer. And so to Alex's point here, so most projects, you know, especially we're talking about pipeline or transferring at long distances, we're talking about putting it in. Well, we'll try not to get too complicated here. They call it a supercritical phase. So it's a supercritical phase of CO two which is basically, you can think of it as a mix between like a gas and a liquid. So it's dense like a liquid, but it has sort of, it takes up, it sort of takes up the volume of the container, like a gas. Okay. It's sort of weird to think about. Um, some people will call it, um, they'll refer to it as dense phase, yes. meaning both supercritical uh, and liquid. Cause some, some, you know, if you subcool it, you can get into liquid phase. And so the typical applications, you know, maybe a typical temperature of, you know, 80 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that, and 1,500, 2,000 pounds is going to be super critical phase. And you can think of it like a liquid. It's a dense phase. So help me here. I understood what you just said, but I, this was a question I was came up on when I was researching it. So when we're injecting CO2, is it a gas stage or is it a solid stage? Or is it in between? Super critical. Okay. 
Super critical. Okay. Now, there are some reservoirs, depending on the reservoir pressure and depending on the temperature of the reservoir, um, where a phase change could happen uh, downhole. And uh, for some projects, it may be necessary to actually... So so a lot of times, the operators won't don't want to take that phase change. And what I mean by that is it's going from super critical to gaseous phase uh, in, in the well bore. And why does it change? Is it temperature related? Yes. Yes. Uh, temperature related. Uh, it could be possible that the reservoir pressure is a little lower. And yep. so sometimes uh, the phase change will actually happen on the surface. So we've done some injection skids that actually have heaters or some sort of system that will put it into a gas right as you're about to inject it down hole so that the phase change happens on the surface instead of in the well bore. Interesting. So it depends, but most applications we see it's super critical phase. Again, going back to my deal, this to me is obviously maybe a new industry and a new technology, but I'm kind of familiar with this. So back in my day in the late eighties, I used to drive around and every producing well would have a casing uh, a valve and it would be wide open and blowing steam out as fast as you can. And then they had this thing called vapor recovery and everyone had to put in vapor recovery. And of course, there those are you know gases and uh, well emissions, but uh, also H two S. And and so there was a lot mm-hmm. of vapor recovery. Th- this is a little different, right? I mean, there was CO two in that probably as well. Absolutely. But so so was this kind of like phase one twenty years ago, and now we're now we're going after maybe more of the the plants and the mass producers, if you will, like maybe stacks and things like that, because is this where we're pulling these CO2 from, from the stacks of maybe a generator or power plant, something like that? Yeah, from a stack is Refining. a common place. I'm, I'm thinking about it more about the, the utilization. So when you, when we, so when you put a CVR, the, the um, vapor uh, collection system on it, um, what the, the, the end life of that gas uh, is either sent to a generator to burn. Yes. Or maybe injected back down hole, but uh, oftentimes sent to a generator or a flare even. Yep. And so the emissions still occur. And so what we're talking about here with this sort of you know new focus on carbon capture and sequestration is doing something with that carbon so that... And, and by the way, this is the tricky part. So I'm sitting here telling you, hey, look, man, we've done this. You know, we've done this for 40 years, 50 years. Human, the human race has got this covered. You know, what are we, what are we talking about? Why is this taking so long? There's a difference, you know, in, in the way... So carbon CO2 handling has been done. And I'm confident in the engineers in our industry and the PhDs at, at, at the universities working on material science. I'm confident with all that. Um, the part that's really uh, tripping people up a little bit is the utilization of the CO2 over the last handful of decades has been an enhanced oil recovery, which is different than sequestration. Right. And for enhanced oil recovery, there's sort of a recycling that occurs with the CO2. Um, with sequestration, the whole point is to put it and leave it underground. You're storing it. You're storing it. And now we're talking about real complex geology. Now, of course, you get into questions about what happens you know, with earthquakes, which, by the way, don't sure. occur at the depths that we usually talk about. Um, water, fault, yeah, water zones. Water zones, faultings, um, or faulting. So, um, look, we're. I think everyone in the industry is trying to be very responsible uh, when we're looking at these problems and trying to say, I mean, look, and there's a lot of economic incentives to do these. So nobody wants a company to put CO2 in the ground that 20 years later is going to come right back to the surface in right. some way, right? So everyone's being real responsible at figuring out how to uh, put it in the ground and leave it uh, in the ground. That's dictated by the EPA. They have pretty strict requirements on making sure that they don't leak. And you can imagine, and that's where one of the synergies comes into play between well done and cornerstones because a part of that process is making sure that the well surrounding your injection target is properly plugged right and the cement design for carbonic acid is not is is designed correctly and And i would have to believe alex that these zones that we're injecting into or storing into have to be extremely tight zones is that accurate or no when you say tight yeah what do you mean for a geologist, tight might mean um, I was thinking like low permeability. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, You're, I know when we seal, have tight I zones, that's, I think that's that, what that's where sealing. we go in and start doing fracking. But you you want to be able to to uh, house the that gas or whatever you're injecting and, and not let it leach to wherever it goes. Am I accurate saying that? That's right. Yeah. yeah. When you say tight, I think it, like a good seal, right? Like yes. it's going to stay. Yeah. yeah. And and by the way, there's a lot of very good natural seals, and in fact, a lot of the um, natural oil and gas deposits, especially the ones that are deeper, the light oil, the gas reservoirs, sure. especially the ones you've seen, Alex, in uh, other states, um, are naturally 
sailing, right? There's gas right. reservoirs underground. Well, they, they exist because they haven't come to surface. Yeah, I, it's, I think it's amazing. Too, one thing to add to that, um, just for listeners that aren't familiar with permeability and porosity, when we talk about sealing, you know, one of the easiest ways that I think about between rock characteristics is you think of like your granite countertop, right? You can pour a glass of water and it's not going to leak in versus right. a sponge, right? So, so rocks naturally have two types of permeability and porosity. When you say tight, us from the engineering perspective think, okay, a ceiling formation, which is critical for that storage of CO2. But in order to actually put CO2 in the formations, you need an extremely permeable and porous rock space, right? Sealed by a non-permeable zone. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of our gas is stored under the ground and we take it as we need it. So it's... It, exactly. You know, it's a common and it happens naturally. Right. I mean, think about all the gas reservoirs. Well, think about the uh, natu- Appalachian in the east it, and think about Sacramento. Sure. I mean, it's a very, you know, yeah. Elk Hills is a fairly tight Elk Hills. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, that's very interesting. So let's talk about uh, funding. Um, I did a little research and I see the U.S. Energy Department gave California about 20 million dollars a couple months ago, uh, which is really not much. Um, it's a start, maybe. Uh, it looks like Chevron and ERA and CRC got most of it, or CRC probably got the majority, and then uh, Chevron and ERA got a piece of it. But then I noticed there's $1.2 billion of grant money given to Texas and Louisiana. Well, why is that? Can we speak to that? Yeah, a, a lot of it's related. So you mentioned um, uh, CRC getting a larger amount than um, ERA yeah. and Chevron, for example. Right. And that was due to the different phases of their projects, right? So, okay. so a lot of this is about timing. And where these projects are, are at. And and I should mention too, right? We, we just talked about carbon capture and we sort of talked about capturing it from stacks. So let me go back. I'm going to go back for a minute if I could. The, the economics of carbon capture are highly, highly dependent on what's called the partial pressure of the CO2 of where you're capturing it, which is a combination of the pressure and the concentration of the CO2. So when we think about a regular stack, like a power plant and uh, CO2 emissions coming out of that power plant, there's about roughly 8% CO2. And it's at atmospheric, right? Because it's coming. So it's at low yep. pressure. It's about 8% CO2. And that's relative, relatively expensive to capture for uh, just to sort of lay that groundwork. So the other thing we haven't talked about is direct air capture. Yes. Right? Which is, the re- which is relevant to this, to the, to the grants. Which so, sounds very difficult to me. To me now, now I'm, <clears throat> when I vision this this morning, it's like, okay, so now are we going to build facilities inside of a dome? I, look, people have got some cr- crazy <laughs> ideas, but yeah, we're talking about now capturing it just out of the air, right? I mean, we're looking at the window. You can imagine some facility out there with some fans and some big mm-hmm. absorbers and mm-hmm. big towers and capture it. And, and the concentration in the air, uh, what is it? 0.04%, yeah. percent, right? And, and the cost is pretty exponential when it comes to, you know, the partial pressure of CO2. So um, the cost of direct air capture is significantly higher, you know, on the order of three, four, five times than even a stack, uh, a natural gas um, generation stack, for example. And then compare that to, for example, like an ethanol plant, which has a, a stream of CO2 that's, you know, greater than 90 percent concentrated. I mean, the, the capture of an ethanol plant is, hey, look, we can we, we do that today. Right. That's not tricky at all. You know, power plant. OK, now we're getting a little expensive. Direct air capture. Whoa. Yeah. Well, that's that, that we're getting tricky. So. And then, of course, you know, there's a lot of new technologies that are coming in to help drive those costs down. But new industries, new technologies, right? We know how this game works. We need the, we need sort of government funding to help sort of kickstart a lot of that. So that's what a lot of this funding is for. And specifically, the ones you mentioned is related to the direct air capture projects. So we do all this carbon capture design and implement these programs and systems. There's not a whole lot of return for the energy provider. Am I correct saying that? Besides, I know if we inject CO2, it could increase production because that's how we produce oil anyway through injection, not necessarily CO2 in California, mostly steam and water. But there are CO2 more on probably in the panhandle well, than, than one anywhere One thing else. to add to that Fire. too, the state of California banned CO2 for uh, enhanced oil recovery. So there's this yep. little bit of a catch-22 on what's allowed with CO2. So that goes back to our conversation about storing it into yep. a tight zone, not just putting it into a uh, reservoir or a zone that's producing. Correct. So that's why you're here, Alex. Yep. So so now we're talking about the economic benefit, right? Of uh, So this is something we talk about a lot. And this really gets philosophical, so I'll try and sort of keep it. So, th- okay, so... If I'm injecting, I'm, I'm an energy company, I'm injecting CO2 in the ground. My current revenue sources are um, federal government uh, grants and tax incentives. Um, 
and uh, in California, you could do potentially, you know, cap and trade abatement or LCF at low carbon fuel standard credits might, you know, depending on the project. Um, and then there's also a voluntary carbon market. Now, through that list, right, all of those are um, either federal, uh, government, state, federally funded incentives to do that. And so we talk a lot about the economic value of injecting, of taking that molecule and putting it underground. There's not a lot of direct economic value. Now, right. the other side might say, look, man, that, that, that molecule of CO2 is causing you know, early adverse health impacts and causing a huge, um, uh, shoot, Troy, you're in the insurance business. I'm sure they talk about the um, premature uh, deaths or illnesses that sure. come from uh, global warming or emissions. So um, somebody could make the argument that, hey, abating that CO2 actually has this huge benefit over here. But the direct value that energy company gets is all incentives. All green energies that way. Well, pretty accurate saying that. Uh, solar, wind. Well, solar energy creates, there's a value, right? There's an electron oh, I get that's it. being used. There's an electron But without that's being the used. Uh, government incentives, I don't think it would be as radical as it is. Fully agree. Fully agree. With carbon capture, uh, what I want to emphasize is carbon capture, it's fully based on incentives. With, sure. with solar, you're at least generating some electrons. Yeah, you're getting something in return. Yeah, yeah. It's a tough concept to hang your hat on. I know incentives from the government. I agree. And you know, one of the things that's challenging for me is, you know, when I look at some of the remediation processes that need to take place for carbon capture, typically some of these wells fall into what they call complex abandonments. Just the level of engineering and capital deployed to seal these wells is, you know, when you hang them on government incentives and these programs is it's tough. Right. I, I could imagine what you're saying. Yeah, there, there are some complex scenarios out there. And I worked on many of those uh, more on the producing side, wells that were just so hot, we couldn't even get a stuffing box to, on them, you know, 350 degrees at the surface. It's like, you know, and eventually it's like, this is too close to the injector. We got to abandon this thing. So yeah, that's going to cost you a lot more money. And of course, uh, when you get into the higher pressures and the, in the, in the gases and things like that, you know, you got to have the equipment, the safeties and uh, yeah, it's a, probably a little more severe, a little more complex when it comes to an abandonment job. Well, and one of the things maybe just to touch on complex, aban- how complex these wells can get, it's, it's pretty fascinating, you know, and it's been done for our utilities companies. Uh, we're talking about taking an existing well, exiting out of the well, drilling a new well next to it. And they have this technology called mag- magnetic ranging where you're basically sensing yourself how close you are to the existing well bore. Then you're going to re-enter that well. So you imagine you're hitting a target a mile or two miles deep, four yep. inches wide, and you're going to re-enter that well and plug that well. So those are the types of complex abandonment work that's taking place for CO2 and gas storage fields. How long has that been going on? That's pretty new. It's pretty new. The intercept world is is not new, but as far as for abandonment purposes, it's uh, fairly new. Because you think about like when you saw that relief well drilling has been a pretty known concept, right? This has been around for a little bit. You think so that's of, very expensive. Yeah, it's very expensive. A lot of technology there. And it's very slow, right? Because it's got to be precise. Yeah, it's got to be precise. You get down there and you're not on target. <laughs> you just yeah. defeated the whole purpose. Exactly. So let's talk about some other energy. So you guys do a lot of things. Tell me uh, what's going on in the energy sector, if you will, and I'll let you take it whichever direction you want to go. The one that stands out the most, the one that we hear from most of our clients that we see everywhere is power. Okay. Right. So uh, the, uh, we, we work in the uh, power, uh, carbon capture, hydrogen, um, hydrocarbon processing, treatment, all that kind of stuff. And there's a couple of different sentiments with power right now. The most common one is, hey, my bill keeps increasing. What can I do? I have right. that problem. <laughs> I just heard last week that they approved another <laughs> increase. Yes. Yep. And I won't get into, and I don't even know all the details. You know, I mean, there's a lot of details and opinions about why and what's going on with PG&E and the utilities and the state and the PUC and the goals. And everyone's in it, you know, people are in a tough spot. But but nonetheless, it's increasing uh, for a number of reasons. Fire risk being one of them, of yep. course. Um, the cost of generating power. Uh, is relatively expensive, it's expensive, especially with the incentives that we just talked about. I think... You know, there's this narrative that likes to say that solar is cheaper than natural gas, for example, or solar power is cheaper than natural And it's it's just more complicated than that. It's more nuanced than that. 
And so procuring the ability to procure all this power is more expensive, I think, than, than people think, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, even the regulators. And so anyway, uh, prices keep going up. Eric, I have a question on that. Have we have you seen like uh, statistics between like California energy prices versus the rest of the state? Like how much more expensive are we? Yeah, so I don't have the multiple on hand, but yeah, we're multiples higher than most states, um, and and both on uh, gasoline, all energy, and electricity, and I believe uh, maybe Hawaii is higher yeah. on uh, natural gas or something like that, or maybe electricity too. But but yeah, we're we're orders of magnitude, you know, for a kilowatt hour here on the order of thirty five cents, maybe for a residential customer versus you know fifteen twenty, um, and 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 some of that is associated with the uh, generation of the power where it's coming from. And the type of power, right? Uh, when what I mean is, you know, uh, hydropower versus nuclear power versus solar power versus natural gas versus coal, right? That mix, that mix of power um, um, matters, right? Supply and demand probably matters as well. Supply and demand. And speaking of demand, you know, we all, um, you know, we turn a light switch on. We expect it to be there. Um, there's a big trend right now. So the second thing that people talk, talk to us about is, is microgrids, right? We're having a huge problem with getting interconnections. And so is there anything, is there anything we can do? You know, can we generate a microgrid? And what I mean by that is, hey, can I, can I put in some power resources that operate independently of the grid, which is not commonly done. If you as a uh, oil and gas producer or a manufacturer or facility want to go generate power and put in a natural gas power plant, you, you, you tie in with in parallel with the grid. So if your natural gas power plant can't produce enough, the grid's there and, you know, all it works, right. all works well. Uh, the idea of a microgrid is, hey, I'm going to operate completely independent. independent. Mm-hmm. Um, are those regulated by the same regulatory agencies? They are. Um, they are. Uh, are we seeing? Are we seeing that, Eric? <clears throat> microgrid uh, yeah. installations. Yeah. Short answer is yes. Um, long answer is not as much as people think. And here's here's the thing. And what this is true with a lot of this energy stuff, right? There's a reason the grid exists. There's a reason you know centralized ownership of infrastructure exists and generation exists. So. Um, we do a lot of studies. We look at a lot of these power projects. And what happens is the the flexibility to go turn on a switch or go turn on a motor or go build another line in your manufacturing facility. Right. The, the ability to have a grid there to support that is, is, is more powerful than people think. And so what ends up happening if you want to put it in a microgrid is you have to over-install. Right. You have to over-install. Sure. You just do if you want the flexibility. I got you. Um, the other thing is you better expect to have natural gas assets. Solar and batteries won't take you that far. So I saw um, the Tejon Ranch. They built a Tesla charging station. Yes. And it's it's powered by <laughs> diesel. I knew this was coming. Is, is that a microgrid or is that classified? <laughs> is it a micro? I actually don't know. It probably is. You know, who knows? So look, I'm a big fan of solar. I think when it makes sense, you know, we put it in for, a, I think it can be cheaper, especially in certain uh, instances. But um, look, guys, solar is not going to save us all. Right. Batteries aren't going to save us all. Um, it's a really complicated scenario. And I think uh, they all have their ups and downs. I mean, nuclear is probably the cleanest energy, but the byproduct is not easy to handle. Right. Oh, uh, disposal. Another issue. Right. That's for sure. That's for sure. We, you know, we were just at the energy summit the other day and one of the one of the PhDs, I, I think he was with Lawrence Livermore. Somebody asked him what his favorite energy source was. And he laughed and he said, don't judge me for this answer. But, you know, yeah, he said fusion. Fusion was his answer, which I, hey, I'm a fan of just regular fission nuclear energy, but yeah. yeah. Hey, it's been good, but we're going to have a little fun before I let you two go. Uh, We're going to get into your uh, personal life maybe here a little bit. And I'll start with Alex. What's the best advice you've ever received? Mm, That's a great question. The best advice I ever received, probably from my parents telling me to follow Jesus. That's been the most uh, influential part of my life is my faith. Uh, From a career standpoint, when I was very young, and I go back to this, it's the balance between work life and family. And uh, good for you. I had a um, a mentor. We got a project late on a Friday night, and I was working it, and I was stressed. And he said, um, "An emergency on somebody else's behalf doesn't constitute an emergency on yourself." And so I've always kind of kept that with me from a planning perspective and looking at my family, my wife, my three kids, right. How do I balance deliverables of today versus work-life balance? And so that's been important. I like that, Alex. At the end of the day, it's all about relationships. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I still struggle with the work-life balance. It's tough. I mean, I mean it's, we all it's do. It's tough, yeah. And, and we have egos, right? And uh, also, you guys are engineers, yep, so yep. you know you want engineers perfection. Don't, engineers don't have egos. You want perfection. There's a few A-type personalities <laughs> over there, I'm sure. <laughs> 
I'll ask you the same question, Eric. It's funny, Troy. I just uh, this just came up in something. You got else more recently. time to think about it, so did, it's going to be a longer answer. No, maybe not longer, but actually, the current uh, my current team at Cornerstone actually. Um, so look, I, I can be. I'm, look, I make mistakes like the rest of us, and I, get, I can be pretty hard on myself, and I'm very critical of sort of uh, how we're moving, how we're progressing. And one of the things that I've been told recently was um, simply to enjoy the journey. And it goes back to relationships. It goes back to the people you're with. And it goes back to just, it, I mean, look, just live in the moment and enjoy it, right? Do the right thing. Follow your heart. Um, follow uh, the faith you have and trust uh, and have peace in that and enjoy the journey. And that's been uh, easier said than done, but it's really helped it helped me a lot to sort of uh, mentally de-stress, if you will. That, that's good advice, but my perspective of you two, and maybe everyone at Cornerstone, but I probably know you guys a little bit better because we spent time together. You don't work for Cornerstone because you needed a job. You guys both have passion in what you do. I love what I do, believe it or not, too, or I wouldn't do it. Yeah. yeah, I need the money, but I can find something else to do. I love what I do, and especially when it comes time to helping people. And you know, uh, and, and you guys, there's a great reward when you complete a project and you can oh. go. We started that from scratch, and the, three years later, boom, here we go. It's, well, it's kind of cool. And I, yeah. I was also that sort of cliche young young person who was like, you know, I'm excited, I want to do all this stuff, and I had a hard time finding. I'll call it a home, right? I had a hard time sort yeah. of figuring out. And and for me, Cornerstone really was. Uh, in alignment with my values and it's sort of a, yeah i mean it goes back it's really cliche people talk about it a lot these days it's harder said than done um but it's it's really important it's more valuable than it's extremely valuable yeah, yeah and i'd like to add to that um a lot of people don't know this but how i came up with well done yeah um you know it's a good name a, by the way thank you appreciate that you know because you're thinking of the well being done producing but there's a story in the bible that talks about um people being given talents right and for me, uh, so the story of this master, he gives people talents and basically he comes back to them and he says, what did you do with the talents that I gave you, right? One guy returned a certain amount of talents, another person returned a certain amount of talents. And so when I was thinking about well done and, and the talents that I believe God has given me, I looked at my life and I said, am I doing everything with my talents, right? And so that story, there's actually the the master comes back and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with what yep. you've given, right? And so that, to your point, you know, how do you maximize everything that you've been given? And I know the leadership team over there, they look at your character and your abilities to lead and to give back. I, I know that is a staple that they look for in every one of their employees and uh, you both meet it with that being said Alex I know uh, I did a little research on you and uh, you have a nonprofit. let's talk about that because uh, it's Christmas time and that's probably the biggest time for your nonprofit. explain it what it is how you started it and what it's all about yeah no thanks Troy appreciate you giving us the opportunity to talk about you that bet. as well so yeah in 2018 uh, me and my wife founded Orly Shoe Drive it's a nonprofit that focuses on providing shoes to kids in uh, disadvantaged communities. And how it started was um, when we were little, me and my brother, uh, we used to get shoes at Christmas time every year from my dad. And um, so my dad passed away in, I guess, nine years now. Okay. So I don't know, do the math. Um, and so after he passed away, my mom said to us, Hey, do you know why you got tennis shoes at Christmas? I'm like, no idea. And I, what, what was the deal? And she said, well, when your dad was young, he was really poor and he used to put cardboard in his shoes. So as a reminder to himself that he was always going to do his best for his boys, he gave you guys tennis shoes. And I was like, wow, that is really cool. Like we want to go out and provide tennis shoes to kids. Yeah. So we got together with some friends and we just said, Hey, we're going to go pass out some shoes. You know, like it's just started very organically as a way to, um, honor that legacy and, and bless other children that maybe were in the same situation as my dad. So we got, I don't know, it was maybe like four or $500. We went and bought a bunch of shoes and these were donations from friends and yep. family and whatnot. Yep. And we just went to the east side, and we just started passing out shoes. We found kids in neighborhoods, laundromats, wherever. Right. And we had all these extra shoes. So we're like, well, okay, well, where do we take these extra shoes? So we went to the homeless shelter there. Um, it's right by a uh, little bit past Luigi's, if you know where Luigi's yep. is at. And um, so we got to this homeless shelter, and it was Christmas time. And they said, oh, yeah, just take your donations over here. And I was like, no, I want to I want to give these shoes to kids, like, you know. Right. And so they said, okay, are you sure? We'll send them out. And there was probably 70 kids that poured out of this homeless shelter. 
And it broke my heart that here at Christmas time, when we're all sitting around enjoying our families, there were all these kids that were in homeless shelters. And I remember looking at one kid specifically, and he didn't have shoes, right? He was outside. It was cold, cold for Bakersfield, yeah. and there was no shoes. And I didn't have the size for him. And at that moment, it was kind of like God put something in our heart that this was bigger than just remembering my dad. This was an avenue to share the true meaning of Christmas and hope with kids, right? And so we said, all right, we're never going to go back to a place to give out shoes without being organized and making sure we have shoes for every kid, mm -hmm. right? And so that has kind of organically grown, um, you know, this year. And my wife leads that charge because, you know, I'm extremely busy. So sure. now I just show up and she tells me, put this box over there. Or I need help with this data <laughs> portion. So she runs that piece. But um, we've just been so blessed. I, I think this year we're, we're trying to give out around 2,000 pairs of shoes. And it, we have so many volunteers. Eric's volunteered, him and his wife. And, it's very cool. Um, yeah, so that's that's a really shoe drive. And how can people find out about it? You have a web page or yes, something if they want to get involved? Yes, you can go to uh, www.orleyshoedrive.com. Um, will you be able to post the link? Yes, we'll put all this information in the show notes. Yeah, and if you're a business and you want to sponsor a classroom or get your employees involved, um, this is a great opportunity to be focused here in Kern County. And, and that's one of the things that we try to tell anybody that wants to partner with us is, your funds or your donations or your application is going directly to the kids in the community that, that you work and live in. That's a great cause. I appreciate it. And it's nice to get a little personal time from you two guys. Hey, podcast listeners, uh, we have Eric Damons, Vice President of Energy and Carbon Solutions with Cornerstone Engineering, and also Alex Vigil, President and Program Manager of Asset Retirement. We appreciate you listening today. Thank you. The show has been brought to you by the law office of Kyle Jones, Troy Burton with The Lynn Company, CPA John Duffield, Scott Hansen Real Estate Lender, Broker and Investor, Dave Plivlich, President and CEO of the Marcom Group and MarcomBranding.com, and Amanda DiGiacomo, President of Atlas Financial Solutions. You've been listening to the Our Two Cents Podcast. Check out the show notes for links and more information about the show. Also visit our website at OurTwoCentsPodcast.com or catch us on Instagram at OurTwoCentsPodcasts. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and share with others.